Hi, everyone. It's been a while. Thank you. Thank you so much. So um, this is a topic. Most of the things that we share on this stage are outside of our areas of expertise. Part of the uh, underlying idea behind Odslan was to give everyone the opportunity to get up on stage and spend, a spend some time doing some responsible research and then cram it into 10 minutes and get up on stage and then mispronounce things really badly outside of whatever might be your areas of academic or professional um, expertise. And I've done that probably more times than anyone on this stage. Um, but my background is actually in fashion history, which is a, a weird side note. And so this is weirdly within my area of expertise. Um, but I'm still going to mispronounce things. Fair warning. And thank you, Lightning, for the attempt to correct my what is going to be terrible, I'm sure. Um, OK, so I'd like to, the last time I spoke, I spoke about post-revolutionary France, and by weird coincidence, I'm going to bring you all back there again this evening. So I'd like to bring you back to the late 1700s, to Paris, and to the idea that stories are sometimes too good not to be true. And as the fires of the French Revolution were coming down and going down and, and turning to ashes, a new generation of rogues and fashionistas emerged from the ashes and they were united by a few things, by their survival of the terror, by their scandalous upsetting fashions and a shared commitment to dance and debauch amongst the ruins. The, the reputation of the strange creatures that had emerged from the revolution uh, spread beyond Paris, beyond France, and newspapers in Germany and England talked about them. And most famously, they spoke of the balls de victimes. They were dances that one could only be invited to if you had lost a relative to the guillotine. The revelers at these parties were known as the Incroyable and Mervelous. Um, and according to the newspaper articles, in the last days of the revolution, the men, the Incroyable, they wore cartoonish ensembles with long, messy hair and pointed shoes. They had enormous lapels and even bigger collars and cravat after cravat after cravat, entirely obscuring the entire neck area. The ladies, the Mervelous, their companions, they were even stranger. They cut their hair short a la guillotine, and in rebellion against the tightly laced and ruffled ensembles of the previous generation, they wore slim, diaphanous gowns, translucent and damp in order to accentuate every curve. They wore sandals like the ancient Romans or bare feet, their arms dripped with jewels. And while they decorated their necks with a strand of red ribbon, just where the blade would have struck. And they danced. Perhaps the most famous description of the victim's ball came from the French historians Edmund and Jules Goncourt, and they wrote, France is dancing. She dances to avenge. She dances to forget. Between her bloody past and her dark future, she dances. Scarcely saved from the guillotine, she dances. France, still bloodied and all ruins, turned, turns and pirouettes and spins about in an immense and mad farandole. Just a handful of contemporary accounts and the barest of details about these balls it was enough to create infamy. And the parties of the Incroyable and Mervelous have become fact through repetition, if not through actual scholarship. Indeed, I'm sad to report that it is possible that the victims' balls may only have ever existed in the fevered minds of newspaper reporters gawking at the strange styles of the rebellious young people that came out after the revolution. And it may well have been that they transformed into common reality just through the artistic interpretations in the centuries since. But the Incroyables and Mervelous, they were real. And they were really weird. Um, just as punks were defined by Thatcher's policies and the politics and the e economics of the 1970s and 1980s, to understand the Incroyables, we have to look at the world that created them and what exactly it was that they were rebelling against. And it's not necessarily what I thought when I first found them. 
So to find out more about them, we have to look a little bit back at the basics of the French Revolution and how things came to pass. And it's tempting, I think, to look at the French Revolution as a successful uprising of the common people, overthrowing both the monarchy and the status quo in favor of a more egalitarian society. But yeah! it turns out, Revolutions are more confusing and complicated and messy than that. And there was no clear consensus of the ultimate goals and who should actually be in charge when everything was done and exactly how many people should be murdered in the streets. So let's review really quickly. The French Revolution took place over a decade. It began in 1789 and it ended with the rise of Napoleon in 1799. In 1789, the Third Estate, otherwise known as the rest of us, rose up and created the National Assembly and then they stormed the Bastille. In 1790 to 1791, there was sort of general mayhem and uprising. In 1792, the guillotine entered the scene, notably. 1793, Louis XVI was executed which set off rather a lot more executions in a period fondly remembered as the terror, which was an official state-sanctioned action. Some 16,000 or more death sentences were passed during the terror in one year, and thousands were taken to the guillotine in the center of Paris, and the streets literally ran with blood. A year later, in July 1794, the pendulum swung. It swung away from the revolutionaries and the horrors of the terror, and there was a counter-revolution that started with the death of Robespierre. Um, in this time, which was known as the Thermidorian Reaction, which I think is a very poetic and classy name for a horrific bloodshed period in time, uh, it was named for the new month of Thermidor in the French calendar. And it's a little confusing to me about exactly why they had to institute a new calendar, because it still had 12 months, but they added a bunch of fancy names to, um, to the months, and it had something to do with the metric system, and it's confusing. Um, but during this brief moment in the Thermidorian Reaction, it saw the emergence of the first group of what we would think of as fashion rebels that led to the incroyable and merveilleuse, the Muscadins. And they brought with them a new round of retaliatory terror that was also, that was known as the White Terror, which was named after the white royalist ribbons that they wore to identify themselves. In October of 1795, the Muscadins were, were um, crushed when Napoleon took command, and he shot cannons of grape shot into the Royalist army, killing 300 people in the streets of Paris, and it ended the Muscadin reign. And then in November 1795, the Directoire began. It was the last four years of the revolution, the beginnings of ambitious wars abroad, and the still bloody, but you know, slightly less bloody, home stretch towards internal stability in France, as long as you consider stability to include the idea of a power-crazed dictator rising to power and the Napoleonic Wars, which was gonna continue for like another decade. So basically, when you're asking, what is it that could possibly make fashions change from this to this, or this to this, or even this to this in just a few years, the answer is rather a lot of this. <laughs> but it shouldn't be surprising that the French Revolution also caused a revolution in fashion because in a lot of ways, the revolution was defined sartorially from the very beginning. The most famous of the rebels were known specifically for part of their dress, the sans culottes. And their outfit included some very defining characteristics. It had this fancy red cap uh, that was very distinctive, the tricolor cockade, which was a brooch of gathered ribbon that they wore to identify themselves, and very importantly, pants. Now, when I first thought about this, I heard the name sans culotte, and I thought it just means like without pants, and that seemed really confusing, but it actually means not just without pants, it means like without these very specific fancy and short and tight pants, but your larger pantaloons are acceptable. Um, so these sartorial emblems became a mark of the revolution and as things started to go really badly wrong in the terror and the revolution started to get a bad reputation abroad, these markers began to stand in as indicators of the behavior of the entire populace in not very flattering ways. You can see all of those markers of the, rev of the sans culotte revolutionaries in this, uh, this cartoon which was from England. 
So as much as the revolutionaries themselves made bold fashion statements, I would say not super good choices, but you know, some bold decisions, it was actually the counter-revolutionaries, the royalists, otherwise known as the bad guys in this story, that are our fashion rebels. They came, they arose in the years following Robespierre's execution, and they marked, that marked the end of the terror and the beginning of that Thermidorian reaction. The Muscadins, who came first, were named either because of their musky perfume or in a very convoluted way that involves looms in Lyon and the south of France and some Italian uh, candies, not totally sure. The Muscadins were not revolutionaries. They were the descendants of or the pretenders to the ruling class, and they used fashion as a weapon of terror. They replaced genteel muted colors and elegant cuts of the, of the aristocracy with bold and clashing hues and oversized lapels and the walking sticks of the gentlemen with gnarled wooden clubs. They were described at the time, it says, they congregated the theater dressed with ridiculous ostentation and show themselves with dirty stockings, large mustaches, and long sabers, threatening the good citizens and especially the people's representatives. They were proto-dandies who prowled the streets, lashing out at the revolutionaries and commoners that had allowed the terror to take hold. And although they affected the styles of the aristocracy, the Muscadins were largely of the merchant and working class. They were the tools of the counter-revolutionary leadership, and they perished because of it. The brief ascent of the Muscadins more or less ended with Napoleon uh, when he acted on behalf of the new revolutionary government and he fired cannons full of grape shot at the royalists in the streets of Paris, setting in place his own ascendancy. But the counter-revolution fashion ball was in motion, and what the Muscadins put down, the Incroyable and Meravelus enthusiastically picked up. As that counter-revolution gained steam, and the aristocrats, and most notably, their young adult children, came back out of exile or released from prison, they took to the streets and back to elegant, private, exclusive gatherings with gusto. And Despite their politics and social class, they did not want to be associated with the specific kinds of sartorial excesses of the pre-revolutionary age, and so they created their own dramatically new fashion that lived for only a few years. The motives and direction of men's styles in the time is not that complicated to break down. The increables basically look like fancy badasses. They picked up on long-standing trends, they kept bits of the previous generation, like the infamous culotte, and then they made everything else kind of extra tight in parts and extra floppy in other parts and wore their hair down. It was not a huge stretch from the generation that came before. But the ladies are more complicated. Their fashion inspiration came from a variety of sources, some of which had been bubbling up for a long time. This is obviously an exaggeration, this is George Cruikshank, an English caricaturist showing the excesses of the um, Mervelus. But their real, their re, the reality of their costume was such a dramatic departure from not just what their parents had worn, but from the, what they themselves had worn five years earlier, that it's remarkable. And perhaps I've never found another incident in history, and all of you fashion nerds can tell me if there's a better example, where something so dramatic has changed in such a short amount of time. But there was a reason behind it, and there were a few of them for the ladies, and the first one is that panniers are some bullshit. Like, once you've walked away from that nonsense, there is no going back. Like, fuck that noise. And then, secondly, the ladies of the revolution had been through some shit. They had fought and they had fled and they had been imprisoned and they had seen their loved ones die. Gendered restrictions on clothing had loosened substantially during the period of the early revolution and once those standards started to slip, there was no way they were going to let them come back. But there were other influences and they came from the classical world. And this is the thing that I think is really interesting. The tradition of the Grand Tour had been going on for a long time. It had been going on through, since the mid-1600s, but came really to be a phenomenon in the 1700s where um, people from Northern Europe traveled down into Spain and into Italy to see the ruins and to see the classical world. And Pompeii, although it had been found several, several decades earlier, it was still new and it was still a 
goal and a destination for French travelers. And you can see the influence that these frescoes might have had on people coming back to Paris because, I mean, these outfits that these ladies are wearing in the frescoes, they're elegant, but they also seem really comfy. <laughs> Additionally, they were influenced, as so many things are, I mean, let's be honest, by sexy spider dances. Um, <laughs> More specifically, the sexy spider dances and the classically inspired attitudes of the infamous Emma Hamilton, better known as Lord Nelson's mistress. In the years before the revolution, she was squirreled away with her older husband living in Italy, where she was inspired by those frescoes in Pompeii and other places. And she began performing what she called attitudes, which were these classically inspired poses that were drawn and illustrated by admirers of her svelte young form. <laughs> and drawings like this had made their way all through northern, northern Europe before the revolution and during the revolution. And she made this look good. And it was a little scandalous, but again, also still comfy, which I think when you compare that to the panniers and the highly restrictive corsetry of the other generation, you're like, yes, let's do that. So finally, you need somebody to place these things in motion and you need fashion icons. And that generation had them in a score of women, but among them, there were two besties, Teresa Tallien and Josephine, not yet Bonaparte. These two ladies were both merveilleux at the height of the craziness, but they also were able to take it and transform it into the graceful elegance that would come to define the directoire period that came after them. And they did this by, um, first of all, making it out of prison, which was a good job on both of their parts. And then they just sort of slowly slept their way to the top. And it, it didn't come without some scandals along the way, but they made it at the end uh, to become two of the most remarkable uh, women and fashion icons of the era and their influence in the, all of the portraits that were done of them during their lifetime. You can see the trickle down effect of individual details of gowns that they wore in their portraits then being imitated within months uh, by fashion houses that came after the revolution. So the Mervilus, during the height of the weirdness, they were the subject of pretty much endless mockery, especially abroad. And there's a popular bit of satire that was repeated in a lot of the, the journals and magazines that publish these kinds of illustrations. And basically the storyline goes like, a proper lady goes to a male milliner and says, help, I'm going to Paris. I don't understand what's happening with fashion in Paris. Can you give me some advice and sell me a dress? And he says, okay, well, take that hat off. And she says, okay, I'll take the hat off. And he says, now take the jacket off. Okay, I'll take the jacket off. Now take that dress off. Okay, I'll take the dress off. Keep going until you're almost naked. Okay, good, you're good. Go to Paris. So the fashion madness of the Incroyables and Mervilus, it was only, it was very short-lived. It only lasted for a few years until really the Directoire and then when Josephine and Napoleon took the throne and sort of toned things down to make things more sort of official and elegant. Um, but it is remembered through this period of enthusiastic satire more than anything else. And that Grecian madness that those young people came up with, it slowly gave way to something a little bit more demure, but the style changes were there to stay, and it spread out from revolutionary Paris to the rest of Europe and the New World. And it's not hard to see the styles of the earliest 20th century in the gowns of the Directoire and the Empire, but also anyone who's ever watched a Jane Austen film knows that this managed to cross the channel in enthusiastically into England for the next couple of generations. For men, it kicked off the beginning of the modern dandy aesthetic. And it was an evolution up from the streets to high fashion, to ar aristocratic culture, and into modern hipsterism, which is sort of a pattern that has followed ever since, which is a marked reversal of the way that things were before this period, where you were always imitating your betters in society. But this is the beginning of sort of street fashion trickling upwards. But for a few years, the weirdos were in charge. So, in memory of them, I'd like to raise my glass, not to their politics, which were somewhat abhorrent, but to their revolution in fashion, to the rebels, the rakes, and the dandies, and the scandalously dressed ladies of all ages who have come after them. May we all continue to make things weird in their footsteps.